The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the privilege through your priesthood to confess sin if necessary. It would be necessary if you're aware of carnality, awareness of personal sin in your life unconfessed. <clears throat> that would put you in carnality. The Holy Spirit is still there. He has not left you. He is not permitted to. John 14, 16 is with you forever. But in dealing with your personal sin, when you confess your sin in 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you, and that allows the Holy Spirit to regain the position of teaching you in Bible study. It's called being spiritual. And the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And if what we're going to try to do tonight is the learning side of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then we'll work with the living side as we leave the church classroom so i give you a moment of silence to take care of that both those who are with us by automobile and those who are with us the internet we expect the same classroom etiquette if you're visiting with us we expect the same courtesy for learning our heavenly father we thank you today for these that have come our way by automobile and internet and we pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls in regard to the New Covenant, which is our subject on Tuesday night. You can't. He said when the New Covenant comes, you told us when the New Covenant comes, the Old Covenant is obsolete and will disappear. And we know it has come because the fulfillment of of the identity of it is the Christ fulfilling the old covenant and bringing it to a, an apex in human history. When he dies on a cross is buried, raised from the dead. 40 days later, he ascends to the father and is seated at the right hand of God, the father in heaven. And we are there. He has become the mediator of the new covenant and he is the high priest of it. And that's what our writer of Hebrews has been trying to teach us in chapters, actually 5 through 10. We have focused on 8, 9, and 10 dealing with the new covenant and the theology of it. And tonight we'll look more deeply into the new covenant theology and we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to us. Because there's so many people in the Christian church that want to keep the old covenant and the new covenant and put them together. Even Jesus said you can't do that in wineskin. You know, the, the parable that he gave about the wineskin. You know, you can't mix the old and the new. And so we pray that we would be, be able to explain that, Father, to the church of Jesus Christ around the world because they're trying to do that. And it, it's uh, the law, purpose of the law, according to Paul, was to point us to Christ. And once we're there, we're done with it. It's, it's about grace. It's not about law. It's about grace. It's about the new covenant. The covenant is this enormous ministry of the Holy Spirit and grace. Teach us that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in Hebrews. I want you to go to Hebrews. Open your Bible. Now, we'll... We'll track you through our study through this, but I want to read it. Hebrews 11, uh, 9, 11, and 12. Because now when we get to the ninth chapter, now he's already hit a lot of theology, but in kind of broad terms. Now he's going to get down into some specifics. For example, I'm going to read two Bible verses, verse 11 and 12, and I'm going to give you five theological points on the new covenant. I mean, now we're, the writer really gets into some pretty, um, some pretty intense teaching on uh, the doctrines of the New Covenant. And what 
what he's doing under the ministry of the Holy Spirit is just as powerful when Moses got him on Mount Sinai. Didn't have all the all the bells and whistles they had then up there. But it's just as important. And so he lays it out grammatically and doctrinally. And here's we here's where we are in nine, eleven, and twelve. Now you you recall that we've gone through nine, one through ten where he's talked about the first covenant has is is being re, replaced by the sec, by the second covenant or the old covenant by the new covenant. He's gone through that. He's gone through some of the details in comparison that here was the the first covenant was about shadow Christology, the new covenant's about historical Christology. Now he gets down into and so we have studied verses 1 through 10 uh, so when he says but when Christ appears as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation or earthly, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all. That holy place you're going to see is going to be heaven. He entered the holy place once for all, and have it obtained eternal redemption. Uh, and that's as far as I want to get tonight. Okay. That's about as, about as much as I can get out of this tonight with you. Because of some of the technical stuff. So I'm going to go through, walk you through some of the stuff, the way it's written. And then pull the doctrine out of it. Uh, What we have, and when we get into the book of Hebrews, what the book of Hebrews is trying to show you is the apex of biblical history. The apex, right here. On this side, this apex. On this side, you have the old covenant. On this side, you have the new covenant. And the apex is Christ comes into the world, okay, virgin birth business, but what's important is he completes his mission. If he doesn't complete, listen, you've probably never thought of this, but the writer is going to tell you. Christ comes into the world as hypostatic man. Comes into the world through the virgin birth. He comes through that business. He's hypostatic man. He's undiminished deity and true humanity forever. And he came from heaven to earth to, for a mission. If he doesn't complete his mission, the only, way, the only way Jesus can get back to heaven once he came is through the cross. If he don't go through the cross, he don't get back to heaven. You understand that? See, that was a struggle in Gethsemane. And you know why that's important? Because nobody does. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. That's how strong the plan is. Nobody. Nobody goes to heaven except through the cross. If Jesus doesn't bear that cross, you understand? That's pretty hard to put your brain around, isn't it? But listen, it shouldn't be too hard because Paul called Adam the first Adam. He called Jesus the last Adam. So... Maybe Gethsemane is a bigger deal than what we might have thought. And so it's a big deal for him to get back to heaven. Because if he doesn't go through the cross, in the fact that he is it, you don't go to heaven, nobody else does either. How about that? Nor anyone else. So I don't know how big the crucifixion of Christ is, but it's the apex of biblical history. And that's what he just said. What he just said. Now, remember, we're now in the ninth chapter of this book. Here's what he says. But Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come. Through the, it really doesn't say, if your Bible says he entered, it really doesn't say that. Through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So we're, we're going to talk about that. This is the apex. And the, whole, the, 
the whole biblical history has been the whole part of this old covenant was to point them to this right here. That's the big deal. Right there is the big deal. And when he does this, human history, this right here says, as far as human history, that started way back here in the garden. Agreed? The garden of Eden. When he says this, he says that we now are in the last days of human history. We're in the last days, right? When he goes right there, that establishes when he comes into the world, we're in the last days. When he dies on the cross, we're in the last hour. So it's kind of interesting, the apex of biblical history, uh, beginning uh, the biblical history, beginning with human history, takes us back to the garden, and all of that, all of this side of it, what we call the Old Covenant, Old Testament, all that's pointing for this. And then here we are in the new side, new covenant side, which takes us all the way to the first, second, coming the rest of the whole shoot match. <clears throat> so in Hebrews 1, 2, when the, when the writer opened the book of Hebrews, which we have now forgotten, and that's okay, what we've forgotten is as in these last days, God has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. I mean, just think of that. The whole eternal life conference that existed over an eternity past looked to that. Not only did the old covenant look to that, but the eternal life conference looked to it. This is the big deal in human history as well as biblical history. So when we read, and you can read also Colossians 1, 16 and 17 on your own, uh, that, that will bear, bear importance to you as well. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, I wrote on your papers, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam came a spiritual body, a spiritual life. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. That's because he goes to the cross. You're not going to be spiritually alive unless you do. Nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. And the whole purpose of the Son was to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, be buried and raised from the dead so we could have life after death. And listen, not only did he give his life after death, he gave his life in the midst of life, didn't he? I mean, just, just think how much God has changed your life. I mean, if, you know, if you, if you knew anything about your life and can remember of it before you got saved, I know a lot of you got saved young, but some of us got saved older. And uh, Christ in my life just revolutionized my life. I mean, it just set me on fire and pushed me in another direction of my life. I, I can bet believe. In Adam all die, in Christ are all made alive. And this is what his mission in life was. The apex of this whole thing. And that's what this writer is talking about when he says, but Christ appeared as a high priest. When he says the word appear, it's an aorist active participle. And he's talking about, he's talking about uh, his um, entrance. I mean, he, when he, he, he's come in and now he's reached his, his mission, which is to go to the cross and, bear the sins of the world and fulfill the old covenant. I mean, he had so many things to do. I mean, I mean, when you have a busy day, you think, oh, I don't know how I get it all done. Um, his whole life was that way. I mean, every minute of his day was taken up with that. The apex, Jesus discussed it when preparing his disciples for his suffering on the cross for the sins of the world. In John 12, 23, preparing for the greater, great, great, for the Passover in the upper room discourse where he's going to really lay out the plan and unfold it personally in their life. In John 12, 23, Jesus answered, he said, the hour has come. If you read the book of John and paid any attention to the book of John, you pay attention to what John is talking about. Until he gets to chapter 12, he says, the hour is coming. The hour is coming. The hour is coming. 
In chapter 12, he says, the hour has come. Chapter 12, because we're about to go into the great, we're a day, a day, a day from now, we're going we're gonna to die on a cross. So Jesus answered, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What he means is I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to be raised from the dead. Okay? And, and we call that the gospel today. I mean, this apex of human history that goes all the way back to the Eternal Life Conference, that apex right there, that's what it's all about. It's exactly what it's all about. And we call that, we call that the gospel. We call that the gospel. On this side, we call that the gospel. Now, on that side, they did too. That was a prophetic gospel. This is a historical gospel. We talk about Jesus Christ coming down on a hill, and, and we call it, Calvary or Golgotha, three days later. I mean, we've got, we can document dates, time, places, people. It's pretty amazing. And we call that the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Uh, you know, according to the scriptures, he died. According to the scriptures, he was buried and raised from the dead. And according to the scriptures, when you believe it, you're saved. According to the scriptures, everything is about according to the scriptures. It's not how you feel or what you think. It's according to the scriptures. In John 12, 27, Jesus says, now my soul has become troubled. Don't you know they all went, what? <laughs> what? Your soul is troubled. You ever heard him say that before? No, I, yeah, see, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Let me tell you, for him, the way home, just like you and me, the way home is through the gospel. Except he is going to be it. If he doesn't complete his mission, he don't get to go back. What do you think of that? He's caught in the same boat that Adam was caught in. Right? It's hard for you to wrap your brain around. I'm just telling you. In Luke 22, 20, at the Last Supper, he lifts the cup. When he lifted it up, he, it was the Passover lamb. When he got through speaking, it, was the, it wasn't the old covenant cup. It was the new covenant cup. It was no longer the blood of the animal. It was now the blood of Christ. He says, he took the cup after supper from eating. He said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. That's what we do at the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 15, 25. And when you lift that, you say, I'm a new covenant person. Why would you lift that cup to honor him and then go back to the law, dear people? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 11 through 28, which we're going to walk our way through, that's the bigger context of what we're after. In the greater passage, the writer gets into grammatical Greek in order to lay out the theology of the new covenant because he's writing to people who were raised under the old covenant and he's trying to get them to understand you got to break away and you got to come into the new covenant and he has to establish a whole new marching order of doctrines. And so he does it in a, a very magnificent way, but it's very difficult. And so this writer, like Paul, you've got to put your thinking cup on, especially if you're a legalist. If you're a person that grew up under the law, you got to do this, got to do that. Oh, God is not happy with you. Oh, you got to do this, got to do that. All about a work system in order to be spiritual, a work system to be saved. You've got to go through this gut-wrenching, say that's not, yeah, but the Bible says so. Yeah, but that's Old Covenant. Yeah, but the Bible says it. Yes, but that's Old Covenant. The Old Covenant's out. The New Covenant's in. You've got to pay attention to what the New Covenant says. You don't live under the Old Covenant. You live under the New Covenant. And listen, you can't put new wine in old, right? can't put new wine in old, whatever that is, wine bags or whatever. Man, just, you people are so smart. Well, 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at, in these two verses, we're going to look at the Greek grammar as he sets this up to teach them new doctrines they must get. And, and there are five of them. In these verses, there are five, and I'm going to identify them as we go through. But to do it, we're going to have to do a little bit of picking through here. So I'm going to walk you through it. Here in verse 11, the first part of verse 11, ninth chapter, verse 11, I wrote in your paper, the word but is a conjunction. It's called an adversive day, a conjunction. It's a trailer hitch. You know, we, we talk about conjunctions as trailer hitches. This is an adversative one. Uh, and what he's been talking about is the, if you read verses, if you read the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 10, he's talked about the old covenant, animal sacrifices, washing regulations, food, and all this kind of stuff, right? And he said, now he says, but, and he's talking about now uh, the, the, the adversative conjunction means in contrast. Now, look, put that aside, and let's talk about the new covenant living, because we don't live that way anymore. He said, yeah, but what's, what's ha why do you say that? Well, because Jesus Christ came, our Messiah came, died at a cross of burial, raised from the dead, We're in a, and he brought in a new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which he discussed. We're into that one now. In the eighth chapter, we studied that. So he begins with a conjunction, uh, but in adversity to the first covenant, which is verses 1 through 10. But Christ, here's the difference. Here's the apex part of this. But Christ appeared. Now, this word appeared is a compound word. is made up of para. That's a preposition with genomai. Now, maybe circle genomai for a moment because we're going to see it again. And this is going to be important. Now, this is what in the, this is a participle, but it's what we call an adtivial, an adjective type of uh, it's called a predicate. And so, I mean, it it's there to shine a light on Christ, on the subject. Here's what this means. that This was written in such a way as to shine the light on Jesus and then to tell you something that he became because of the new covenant that he could have never become in the old covenant. Are you with me? And so this is a way to do that. This is a this is an uh, an adjective that that's verbal, but but l used as an adjective. In other words, it it flares something up, and so it Christ appears appears in biblical history. He appears in human history. The light is shining on who has come that's doing all this change. Who is that guy? Right. The Lone Ranger. No, it's it's Christ. See? Well, I used to love to listen to him. Gene Autry, Lash LaRue. I live for these guys. Oh, man, older than all of you. But who's 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 counting? So this is used when it says appearing. The light shines on who is appearing. Christ. Is appearing. And why is he appearing? Do you see? Now you couldn't see all that. So I had to be able to, you could see that. That's how that aorist active participle is being used. Okay? Shine the light on Christ. Why are we shining it on him? Why isn't it on Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel? Why isn't it there? Because he is the new high priest. He could have never been. He was from the tribe of Judah. He could have never been a high priest because he would have had to have been from the tribe of Levi. So he's a tribe unto himself. Oh, I don't know about a tribe. I just know he, Christ, the Messiah, has come into human history. And here's what he is. He's a high priest, not after their order of Levi. The old covenant is out. The Levi system is kaput. Because he's in, and he's in, and, the, and that tells you there's a whole new order of sacrifices. You have no idea. I have to work to give you this stuff. I, 
I ought to get bonuses or something for this. But Christ appeared as a high priest. Now watch this. Of Listen. Christ appears at the apex of human history, biblical history. Ah, well, let me think what song. Yeah, well. Oh, I know. I don't know. Are you talking to me or Jesus? Uh, Because... He could probably help you with that answer, but I couldn't. All right. But Christ appeared. That's an aorist tense. Christ appeared, talking about the apex of human history, trying to look at another aspect of Christ coming into the world. He appears as a high priest. Now, watch this high priest. So here we got up here. We've got this shines back here to Christ, the Messiah, and shines over here to the high priest. Because the Old Testament prophesied he would come. They weren't sure about all he would become because all they had a little bit was this prophecy of Jeremiah 31 of the new covenant. But he says, priest, but he says now when he comes, when he comes in the apex and fulfills his responsibility, Christ, when he fulfills his mission, is going to become the high priest. You know when he became the high priest? He didn't come because he, he didn't come... He didn't come on this side of the crucifixion. He became the high priest on this side of the crucifixion. On the new covenant side. Couldn't be a, couldn't be a high priest. Until, until this was completely, shadow crystallity was completely taken care of, that can't be possible. Once this takes care of this, that's possible. A new order. New sheriff in town. New order. Right? You getting this? Then you ought to walk it out and live it. No more of this old covenant foolishness in your life. Get out of that. Get into grace. Get into grace. Get out of law and get in grace. Now, you, listen. He says, you know what this? You know what this represents? Now, he says, this represents. See? Christ completing his commission. But this what it represents. What's he tell you? Look on your paper. What's it tell you? When when he's identified, when he represents this positionally, when he becomes the high priest, he's the high priest of what? Good things to come. Good things to come. Good things to come. You know what that is? That's new covenant. The covenant, the The new covenant is the good things to come. Do you know that you're like, listen, you ought to get up every morning and know that good things are coming. Good things are coming. We live in the day of good things are coming. And you said, (laughs) good things are coming. Go back to this passage. Did Jesus Christ die on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead? Yeah. Did he go back and be seated at the right hand of God the Father? Yeah. Well, He is our high priest, and because he's our high priest, the new covenant is in, and because we're new covenant things, you can live under new, what? Good things have come. Good things have come, right? A high priest of the good things to come. And you know what the word to come is? Ginomai. Did I write it on your paper? Yeah, see, Genomai? See, Agathos, Ton. Ton is a definite article that goes with Genomai. See that? And guess what it is? Adjectival. Adjectival just like why he came and appeared, right? See the two adjectivals? They're, they're linked. Christ appeared. When that high priest identity is then... Then what he appeared for under the new covenant is the good things to come. I live for that. I'm excited every day. I get out of bed. The first thing I say in my head, good things are coming. How do you know, Ron? Because I live in the new covenant. And I know whatever happens to my life is going to turn out for good because I live in the good period of time. da 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 
And why would you get up and then let get up oh, another day? Oh, it sucks. You're not even out of bed yet. Well, the devil loves playing at your house. Don't let him do that. Listen, we live in the day. Even though we're in the last days of human history, we're in the day of the good things to come. You know what that word good is? Agathos. You know where good things come from? God's grace. Every day, God's grace is ready to flow through your life. God is agathos. And everything God does is agathos. And we identify that in our Christian life under the church age of the new covenant as grace. Grace abundant. Grace abundant. John 10.10, 10, Jesus, when, when this thing comes, when this thing comes, you will find uh, the abundant life. Did he not say that? John 10.10. 10. And when now the abundant life, he calls good things to come. I'm looking for him too. I'm look for him every day. And if and if and if it gets crosshaired in my life, I I pull that thing back. I say Romans eight twenty eight. It's up to me to keep what that good. I live. Listen, I didn't choose to live here. Christ, God chose me to live in the day I live in, and I, I listen. Right there in Christ, I can live the good things to come. It's up to me to keep them that way. I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to let anybody get it from me. You know, your biggest problem is not other people stealing it from you or causing you to stumble. It, listen, the truth of the matter is, you're, you're you're your worst enemy, are we not? And I'm talking about myself. I mean, it's just easier to talk about you. <laughs> that talk about myself and start to cry a little bit. <clears throat> the good things to come, right? Good things to come. The good things to come. William, you're not going to have to learn that ten times. Oh, no, you got that one. I could see it. I saw the eyes click. I went, He's got that one. Won't be no ten times in that. That's a take it home and put it in the bank, ain't it? That's right. I know, Bubba. I know. I heard that. Now, here's the first doctrinal point. Christ's historical appearing, his historical appearance as the high priest defines church-age believers' priesthood as, as one of good things to come. hoo -ah. Now, if I was back in my old Baptist days, I'd pass the offer, offertory plate right now and get you. <laughs> I get I get you right now. No, I'm just kidding with you. I'm just kidding with you. One of the good one of the good things that come out of his priesthood. Watch this now. N nobody else had this. You couldn't be an Adam would be this. A priest. I have people all the time say to me, "Where do you get the idea that every believer is a priest?" Right there. And I'll tell you what kind of priest you are. You're a priest after the high priesthood of Christ, which is after the order of Melchizedek, but your priesthood is not after Melchizedek. His is. Yours after Christ. Christ says that you're holy and that you're royal. Remember that? First, well, I wrote on your paper, First Peter 2, 5, and 9, somewhere. And you know what that is? In that little pamphlet of 50 things you receive in, at salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity? It's one of the 20 status privileges, one of the 20 status privileges of every church age believer that you're a priest. <laughs> <Hoo -ah. laughs> That's just so good. Thank you, Jesus. So good. Church age priest. The writer of Hebrews is making a case for the coming of the new covenant with the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session of Jesus Christ, which he's made his argument in the book of Hebrews up, up to where we are today because of Jeremiah 31, 31, 32, his emphasis on the old covenant being fulfilled in the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. 
in the second half of the ninth chapter, verse 11, he does something really interesting. See the word through? Now listen to me. It's called, it's a dia. That's the word, Greek word for through. It's dia plus the genitive of description. Those who go through, you know, you, you, you're familiar with the genitive of description. So this is typical. This is a good one. Now, what, above that word through, I want you to write the word one. This is one of three. This is important. Through, now, let's go back because this is the second half there. Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come through, through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not, see the word ook? Circle that because that's going to be important. Not made with hands, that is, not, see the second not? Right? Out of this creation, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, meaning not earthly, but heavenly. The greater, more perfect tabernacle refers to the perfect sacrifice, i.e. the blood of Christ for the sins of the world. Now, it'll take you the rest of the chapter 9 to get it all laid out. I'm just giving you a heads up on it. The rest of the chapter is going to lay this argument out. We're just in verse 11 and 12. I'm just in verse 11 right now. The greater, more perfect tabernacle. When you study out what he's talking about, the tabernacle, he's not talking about the tabernacle of the Old Testament. He's not talking about an earthly, right? Did he not say, I'm not talking about earthly? I'm talking about heavenly. All right. In other words, the analogy is spiritual for him. The greater, more perfect tabernacle refers to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now they're going to the cross and becoming the, the sacrifice for the sin of the world. You know, like, like John 1, 29, Behold, the Lamb of God has come to take away the sin of the world. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, uh, Jesus Christ is the Passover Lamb, right? 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, uh, Christ has to be a Lamb that goes to the cross without blemish and spot, no birth defects, no, no, no uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, all of that, what does it mean Christ becomes my Messiah? He has to qualify. Uh, John says he has to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Peter says he has to be a lamb without blemish and spot. No birth defects, can't be out of Adam's sin, and uh, can't have personal sin. He's got to go to the cross and complete his mission. You understand? <clears throat> And when he does, then he is the Passover lamb. Fulfills that old covenant responsibility. And that's what the writer is talking about when he's talking about the greater, more perfect tabernacle. He's talking about what is the purpose of it. Listen, did we not study what the purpose was? It, it was the inner two, two tabernacles inside, the holy place and the holies of holies. And the greater of this was the holies of holies. Why? Because the, that's where the mercy seat was. Why is the mercy seat? Because there's where atonement took place. The blood of the animal was put there and representative of Christ. Right. Here's the second doctrinal point. This is the second important doctrinal point the writer of Hebrews is saying about the new covenant and the importance of Jesus Christ. In the first point, it's because he is the Listen to me. In the first point, it's because he qualifies seated at the right hand of God the Father going through the mission. He, re, he qualifies as the high priest of a new order. A whole new order. Agree? Well, don't have to agree. Just truth. Okay? I can't make you believe it. Not my job. Now, when he comes to this point, he says not only this, but he is the mediator. And now he, he uh, the, on this side, he says he is the mediator now, we know he is the mediator. This is the second thing that's come down from that. Now, he told his disciples this when he, when he was getting ready. In John 14, at the upper room discourse, in John 14, you know, John 14, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, he tells them, I am the, this is in the upper room discourse that you keep quoting this verse from, which is good. 
I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the mediatorship. That's what a medi- That's the mediatorship. Listen, Paul lays this mediatorship out in 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, and it's exactly what he says. He says that, that Christ is mediator between sinful man and holy God. And the only way to get, get, get from uh, unrighteousness to righteousness is through Christ. Works can't do it. The work of Christ on the cross does it. This is pretty good stuff. So the second point, as a mediator of the new covenant, and, and when we get into look, sometime on your own, look, at, look ahead a little bit and, and uh, Hebrews 9.15 where he, sa- he actually says it. He is the mediator of the new covenant. As a mediator of the new covenant, Jesus establishes a new and unique priesthood for the new covenant. And listen, not only that, but he is the gospel. And we're sent out as ambassadors of the gospel to preach his mediatorship, right? We're, you know, 2 Corinthians, look, here we are, 2 Corinthians 5, um, 17 through 21, somewhere in there, okay? He's a mediator. He's the mediator. And we're the ambassadors of that message. Is a meter. No man can get to the Father. Listen, everybody has to go through the cross. There had to be a cross for Jesus, except he had to bear it. There were, listen, once he came, there was no way out. Same as you, there's no other way out. You're not going to get to heaven any other way but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not going to get to heaven any other way. I don't care. I don't care if your dad's a whatever or your grandpa, or your third uncle, or whatever. Listen, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe it, you're in. You didn't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to lose it. That's because you're saved by grace through faith, and not of yourself. Is a gift, not of works. That's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I know. People say to me, Ron, I'm so tired of hearing you that say that all the time. Are you kidding me? Too tired of hearing to say that Jesus saves you from hell? I'm going to say it to the day I die. It's not the choice to be if you don't like to hear the gospel. I can tell you that. This ain't the place because, you know, that's why we're in existence. That's why I'm still in the pulpit. Now, what he's talking about is a mediator. What he's talking about is that message right there. He is the mediator, and that's the message, and that's the message, the gospel that we carry to the world. And 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 this is his. And this is a great point that he's trying to make. And you recall when we when we put this thing up here. The only thing worse than my board is my notes. If anybody knows, ever seen my notes, then you know what I'm talking about. But when you put the cross up here and you put the, the in Adam over here, you recall, in Adam all are dead, spiritually dead. You got to go through Christ. And over here, if you go through Christ, then in Christ, everybody is spiritually alive. Everybody's spiritual dead. You go through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go through the gospel of Jesus. And I love this one. This is one of my favorite Bible verses for that. Colossians 1.13. That's my very favorite. Because it says two things. It says that you are rescued. You are rescued from in Adam. And you are transferred by the grace of God into Jesus, into Christ through what he did for you when you believe, when you believe it. You don't work for it, but when you believe it. (laughs) That's pretty good stuff. That's pretty good stuff. So there's a second doctrinal point. Now, my second point is to take you to Hebrews 9.2. I only did two, but I gave you five points. 
we will study the Greek grammar with three more doctrines on New Covenant theology in verse 12, Hebrew 9, 12. Now, remember I told you to pay attention to those, those ooks, those not. Well, in verse 9, it opens with the English, it says, and not. Are you with me? Does your Bible say and not? It should say something like that. Or it might say, but not. Your Bible might say, but not, or and not. It might say, but by. Well, that's not too good. <clears throat> but in verse 12, it should say, it could say, and not, or but not, because it's ook day. See, O-U-D-E. Now, you, you know what O-U goes with? Ook, O-U-K. That, that's a negative particle. Ook, not, that's a negative, not. And with day, that's a conjunction. That's a part, part of conjunction use. Okay? So he puts them together. That's ook day. That's ook day. But not. And it should be translated, but not. Now, let's go back because he's, he's hooked you up here. But Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through blood of goats and calves. Now, what he did with Ukde is he just grabbed up there those two other knots and brought them together and made a big one. He just made a big one. So when you look up to the other ones, he says, through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not, not made, not, not of this creation. And then he comes back and not of, say he's pulled them down there. He's just tearing down this old, this old structure. He's going in there and tearing down that whole, whole old structure so that there's only one. Do you understand that? He's going in and torn down that whole structure. He's, he's just tearing it down so that there's only one left. Now, God had to send the Roman army in to get the point over to him. But he tore the whole system down so that that's all that's left. If you can see that, then you're off to the races. This, this, this ude is what we call a disjunctive. It's, it's, a, it's used like a conjunction, but it's, it's a disjunctive. And so you're looking for, for, for other trailer hitch kind of businesses with it. And so the other two ooks, see, this is an ook, ook, and ook day. See, that's, I actually have three ooks right here, right? Because ude is ook day. <laughs> and what is that for, Ron? He's tearing down the old system and removing it so that you're, you only have one. You only have one, people. You only have one. This is called the New Covenant Church Age. And not, and not through, not through, right? What did I tell you to do with the first through and the first through in 9-11? What did I tell you to do? I told you to put a one up there by it. This put number two here. This is number two. All right. The first one, through the greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not of this creation. Not of, verse 12, not of blood of goats, not through, say here, not through. Right. See the connection with the knots and through? But, you know, somebody just tuning in and thought they'd find just a little happy message here. You know, rah, rah, go get them, gang, and just send me a contribution if you can kind of message. They got me. Just stay. Don't leave. Just stay. Just stay. Not through the blood of goats, but there's an adversative conjunction, but through, what number is that? That's number three. 
Notice something else. The first through, th- the first through, <laughs> the first through was dia plus the genitive of description. Agreed? All right, top of your paper. Agreed? What's the second one? What's the third one? Getting a point? These now become markers for us. Right? They're markers in the Greek language. They're markers. There's no way you can see this in English. How would you possibly see that in English? They're set up as markers. Through the great moral entanglement. Not of, not of hands, not of creation. Uh, not through blood, uh, blood of goats and calves, old, old covenant. Uh, but through his own blood. Right there, see that? Not this. He, said, he says, keep, take that out. Take that away, right? That's kaput. Christ, Christ covered all that right there. Get rid of that stuff. It's no longer legit. Get rid of it. See, when Luther discovered this, it got him so much trouble. It will you too. It did, by the way, when I discovered all this, it got me in a whole lot of trouble too. That's why I'm a lone ranger out here. Got me in a whole lot of trouble. You, you would think it wouldn't. But whoever this writer was, it got him in a whole lot of trouble too. And when James discovered it, the brother of John, it got him in a whole lot of trouble. And when Stephen discovered it, it got him in a whole lot of trouble. Because people come out with him to get him. To persecute him to the nth of their, of their life unto death. Oh, you say, well, they probably didn't live in a civilized culture like I live in. (laughs) We live in a civilized culture? I don't know. We should in the church, but I don't know about the world. Through, so we have the third, through his own blood. And now, see, he comes back. And what he's doing, he's with these, the one section of this system, he's taking out the old covenant. And on the other part of the system, he's establishing new. You understand that? Okay, well, if you're going to take away the blood of goats, what are you going to put in place? The blood of Christ, the Messiah's blood. Well, the Jews thought that was the most apostate idea that they ever heard in their life, and so they killed him. If they'd have just hung around, he said, I can get you another job. Because they're worried he's taking it all away. Well, this man is going to destroy our religion. He's going to destroy it. He's going to destroy it. He's going to take all of our people away. I get, listen, I got it. I've got you. I, I'll, I'll put you, I'll get you, I'll get you a job. That's the deal. I can get you a job. And I, I love that in Acts 5 when it says, and listen, when the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, the priest went, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Because the inner sanctuary was gone. And everybody knew from the top to the bottom, man, God did it. And they were out of a job. And so they all signed up with Jesus. I give you a job. You want a job? Job's the easiest thing in the world. (laughs) I give you a job. Christians, they sit around, I can't find a job. I can't find a job. Are you kidding me? Have you talked to the Lord? No, but I've talked to the Alabama uh, unemployment, and I've talked to two of my friends. And you better talk to Jesus because he's in the employment business. Get you a job. May not one you like. Be the one he wants for you. How about that? Wouldn't that be good? I got the job that he wanted for me to have. <laughs> if you don't like the job you got, maybe you ought to look for one he's got for you. Wouldn't that be good? I've had jobs I didn't like. My grandfather's smart enough to tell me, go find one you like, son. Don't don't stay in a job you hate. You're working for money. The last thing you want to do is work for money. My grandfather was a farmer. Last thing she, he says you want to work for. We never work for money. We work for everything else but money. 
We wanted, we, we needed something on the farm. We just went and bartered. <laughs> no money was passed. I don't know what money was until I was growing. You, just, you had two marbles, you shot out until you got three. Does I know the guy play marbles? I had snake, I had one that had snake eyes. Nobody could get that from me. It's probably demonic, but boy, did I work that baby. The green, the green eyes, you know, probably it was probably demonic. Uh, what well, it's called cat eyes, but it was it's green looking. Is we didn't roll it? Does it like? And I could, I, I don't know. I just had everybody psyched out with it. I pulled that baby out. Everybody went, uh, here's the marbles. The people know my kids. I said to my grandkids one day, my older ones. I said, hey, let's let's shoot some. And they had no idea what I was talking about. Marbles. Let's let's shoot some marbles. If they can't find if they can't find that internet, they don't know what you're talking about. What what fun that used to be. Girls would even get down and shoot with you. Everybody everybody had a little bag of marbles, always trading marbles and stuff. I love that. I might go home and play marbles with Jane. That'd be interesting. She's about uh, got all mine anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> all my marbles. Uh, through his own blood, watch this now, he entered into, see the ice, erkomai? The ice on the front of it means into. Now watch this. This is really good. You see the ice on the front of the word? Look behind, behind where it says into. Look what it is. Ice. It's into, into. Isn't that interesting? Because it should, and that's exactly in the Greek, it says, through his own blood, he entered into, into the holy place. And, and here's what he means. In order to get back to heaven, because he's talking about going back to heaven here, the holy place for Jesus is going back to heaven. He's got to go through this. He's got to go through his blood, right? He's got to go through his own blood. In order to get, and this is what the point is, in order to get ice into heaven see you wonder ron i don't you know i saw your eyes glaze over when i said jesus came here but if he don't go if he don't go through the cross he don't get back home your eyes glazed over you went i don't think so yeah yeah i I mean he's the son of god i don't think so that's where i got it right there's where i got it you missed it why'd you miss that that's bigger than life. If it, man, you're never going to hear anybody tell you that. Listen, this is Isaiah Colmai. He's got to go through that, his own blood, and it's through his own blood that he's going to ice plus the, right, into. Ice plus the accusative, into. He's going to have to go into to get into. He's got to go, he's got to go into this arena of the crucifixion where it's his blood for the sins of the world in order to get back into heaven. Thank God he went that way because that's the only way we can get there. Because, listen, the calf system's gone. We, we eat him now. We, <laughs> if we're lucky. The price of beef is going out of sight. I've become a chicken man. Into his blood, he entered into, uh, through his own blood, he entered into, entered into, right? See how they say how they arrange? You got to figure that out. Well, you got the blood on the one side, you got heaven on the other, right? He's got to enter into this in order to get back to this. Okay. And how excited he was. Uh, oh, Father, don't leave. Listen, when I get through the cloth, don't leave my soul in Sheol, Right? I mean, you know, he, he's, he's quoting the scriptures, get me back, because my whole deal now is get back to heaven. How wonderful God is. God is true to his word always, always, always in every case, always true to his word. And he's always true to you, whether you are to him or not. You could, you could be untrue to him half your life. He'll still be true to yours your whole life. 
And he don't play the game all where you don't, you know, you only gave me half a sandwich, so you don't get but a half a sandwich. He don't play that game. Thank God, because he works by grace. Through his own blood, he entered into the holy place, heaven, once for all, having obtained. Isn't that interesting, this word obtained? It, it's a good word, but it's an interesting word. This is, this is a word that's normally to find or discover. I found, if it's aorist, I find if it's present. This is the aorist tense. It would normally be, I have found. Once for all, having found eternal redemption. But that's not what he did. He obtained it. And that's a good translation of that word, which is not normally that word. It, and, and I've covered this. I've covered the connection between the, the ude ux, 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 and the, uh, the through, the dia plus the accusative through, Right which covers that. And the idea was what it was, we're going to tear down the Old Testament. We're going to tear down that old covenant and all you're going to be left with is a new covenant to operate from. That's your whole operational system. The Christian life operates off from the new covenant. It doesn't offer, offer, operate off the old covenant. So here's the third doctrinal point. The new covenant blood of Jesus Christ is superior to shadow Christology blood of the old covenant. Agreed? See, that's very important. That's very important. Because, listen, the old law is going to say, is always going to add works. The law is always going to add work. It's going to be salvation by grace through faith plus works. No, no, no. Right? Well, you've got to repent. You've got to, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. Then you can be saved. Mm-mm. Absolutely not. Listen, he went and did all that work right there on that cross so that you would have to do none of it, eliminate every bit of it. And, and, and sometimes it's, it, listen, it, probably one of the hardest things to explain to an unbeliever is grace. It's easy to explain works. I can remember me asking him, well, wh wh what do you expect from me now? You say, if I believe, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the deal? What do what you want from me in order for me to get saved? They said, absolutely nothing. Nothing from you. After you get saved, we'll see how it goes, but nothing before it. Get nothing. I, that was the hardest thing. I couldn't break. I, I mean, how do, you break, how do you wrap your brain around gift without a, a hitch? <laughs> Right? I mean, every time somebody gives you something, you go, mm. Right? Mm. I mean. Here's the fourth point, fourth doctrinal point. Once Jesus was seated at the right hand of God in heaven, I'm going back to heaven as soon as I get through my work job here, I'm going back to heaven. Once Jesus was seated at the right hand of God the Father, eternal redemption was obtained once for all. You understand that? He gets back, boom, it's done. There it is. It's done. That was done. When he said it was finished, it was finished. But the whole deal of establishing the new covenant has got to be when he seats at the right hand of God the Father, the new covenant is in lock, stock, and barrel. Once Jesus seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, eternal redemption was attained once for all. Every church age believer, that's cab, every church age believer enters the eternal redemption at the point of salvation, remains there forever because Jesus does. Right? People say, Why do you, how do you know you got eternal life? Because Jesus sits at the right hand of God, the Father with eternal life and gives it to me. <laughs> I don't have to earn it. It's a gift. I don't earn it. I don't I didn't earn it to get it. I don't earn it to keep it. That's why it's grace. It's not why it's a gift. Somebody paid for the gift, right? Anytime you get a gift, somebody's paid for it. Grace shines a light on God's great plan of love, mercy, and grace. That's what I like about it. 
The fifth doctrinal point, every church age believer goes to heaven when he dies because he enters the holy place by the blood of Jesus. The holy place is heaven in, in the context of this passage. That's why he goes there because Christ paid the ultimate price to put him there. Let me close with this. Well, you know 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8. You know that. You know 7 because walk by faith, not by sight. But we often miss 6 and 8. I mean, that's the meat of the sandwich. But in between that sandwich is to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Answer from the body, be present with the Lord. You know why? Because that's where he is. Where is that going to be, Ron? Going to be in heaven. It's where he is. I'm going to the holy place. I ain't going to the holy land. I'm going to the holy place. Through the blood of Christ. He calls it the new and living way. For Christ did not enter a holy... Watch this. This is 924. We'll be there some, some, sometime or another. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands a mere copy of the true one. That's from heaven but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. That's Hooper plus the ablative, on our behalf. I mean, now don't, listen, listen, it had been enough just for he, him to save me. But to give me the abundant life while I'm here, and then when I get to heaven, whoo I mean, I don't know how to describe that. I mean, how good is that? And there he sits in heaven at the right hand of God the Father on our behalf. Listen, he goes back to heaven and he's now there to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. That's, that's Hebrews 7.25. I mean, on our behalf. And boy, I think for most of us, we got to have somebody like that up there, Right? If you want a name drop, drop that one in there. I mean, I don't know how many times I go like, oh, boy, you better bail me out of this one, Lord, because I just really got in trouble. And they go like, well, come over here and let me slap you a couple times, then I'll fix it. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, you're lucky you don't treat you that way. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, I hope you have that tonight. Since we have confidence to enter the whole place, the, uh, confidence. Listen, do you have the confidence? Ladies and people say, are you confident when you die, you go to heaven? Not based on your performance. It's based on his performance. Did he die? Did, was he buried? You know, free on, on your behalf. Does he represent? Listen, you know why, you, why you're going to go there? He still represents you. On, on your, he still represents you. It represents you. He's there on your behalf to represent you. Okay? Well, anyhow. All right. I ran over a little bit tonight. But... Just keep those cards and letters coming. That's okay. You're fine. Well, let me close in a word of prayer, and we'll let the Internet people off, and then the rest of us that are able to stay will have a a moment of prayer together. Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet to be with us in this Bible study. Boy, I tell you, just two verses, but whoa, were they ever loaded. What, how exciting it is to open it up and look at it and have it speak to our hearts in such a way. You know, many years ago, I got this little phrase of good things to come. And it just changed my aspect of my life, my, my attitude and my, my presence uh, each day of what that day would hold for me in the joy of the Lord. I hope others might grasp something like that that would remind them that there are good things coming. And this is the life. And not just for time, but for eternity. Good things coming. Good things coming is what the writer told us tonight. Both time and eternity, good things coming. We are new covenant people. Thank you, Father, for this. May people grasp it, Father. The five great doctrinal points that he's given us under the new covenant out of verse 11 and 12. 
May we embrace them in our life under the new covenant people. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.